Maybe. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, this is the first Violence on Top we've had in person since the beginning of the pandemic. So we're very happy about this. Um, so if you're not familiar with Science on Top, which I imagine you probably are if you're here, but this is an event that the Science Policy Society puts on. We do it once a month. And we try to bring in um, different researchers, usually professors from Penn State, to talk about their research in a way that's very high level, that's very um, accessible to a general audience. Um, we're going to be recording this today and also sharing it on YouTube, so hopefully it reaches a much wider audience that we have here today. Um, this is just one of the events that our group does. We, yeah, we're the Science Policy Society, so we do operate at the intersection of science and policy. And so we're mostly a group of graduate students in different areas of STEM, and um, we are interested in seeing how we, as scientists, can interface with the decisions that our policymakers make. And a very important part of that is learning to communicate science. So this is really important to us, the Science on Tap, um, because a big part of you know communicating with legislators is just learning how to communicate, period. And communicating to the public um, kind of falls in the same realm with that. So um, we're very excited today. We're going to have Dr. Venkat Gopalan from the Material Science and Engineering Department at Penn State, and Dr. Martin Bojovald, who is in the Physics Department here at Penn State. Um, and I will turn it over to them. So, I think I'm going to be Um, so I just okay. Yeah, this is great. Um, thank you. What a wonderful place. What a beautiful ambiance. Uh, so thank you, Angela. As soon as she said, you know, you want to do this, I'm like, where Voodoo Brewery? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> I, I didn't know what this was about. I've never. I, I'm a key hurtler, but I, you know, this is this is going on my CV. <laughs> Um, and uh, I did. I did work very hard on this. Um, it's this communication part, but uh, somewhat it looks like a group meeting. So maybe I, I just <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, we all sort of intuitively understand symmetry, and I'm gonna. My talk is symphony of Adam. I'm gonna leave the universe to Martin, uh, who will tell you all about uh, Big Bang. And um, so here's uh, a, a, a beautiful snowflake, and I said beautiful, and uh, so there's some beauty to it, right? And so what what, what what's beautiful to you? What, what's the beauty part of it for you? <laughs> Am I giving this away here? <laughs> okay, you can be frank. It's not even beautiful, maybe. Or something else? Is, is there anything else? Uh, symmetry is, is, is great. <laughs> Any other aspect of this? The color. The color, yeah, it's it's a, the visual it's aspect it's of it. Yeah. But if I took away the symmetry, something will be missing, right? right? So so the, the fact that it's a hexagon <laughs> just sort of stands out first in your head. And then you wonder why is it a hexagon? Are all of them hexagons? It turns out they're all types of snowflakes, and they're all exact. But then, you know, that, that's the exciting part. That's the symmetry part your brain grabs onto. And then you say, wait, uh, are all the arms the same? They're kind of same. You start looking at the details, and they're not quite the same, right? And then you look at different snowflakes. They're not similar at all. And uh, the... You know, if you zoom down to Adam, that's what I'm going to talk about, you'll see when it turn, turns around, you'll see a hexagonal symmetry there, right? Of water molecules arranging when frozen uh, below zero degrees. And the hexagon that immediately has six sides, we, it has a rotation. It's, we call it six-fold rotation. You'll hear the word folds. Six-fold rotation means six times in one circle it looks the same. A 
hexagon, a regular hexagon would do that, right? Okay, so, um, so like I said, you know, it's great at, this, at the atomic level, it might look like that, and, um, but then you start looking at different snowflakes and they're all different, right? There's a huge amount of diversity, although at the nucleus of it, there is the symmetry, there's this fundamental hexagonal symmetry, and they're all six-sided, right? That's not changing. And if you really zoom in, scanning electron microscope, I did find it. And uh, you see, you know, all these angles are really 120 degrees, or they look very close to 120 degrees. But if you go in and measure the ruler, maybe they don't look well. You know, they're a few degrees off here or there. The arms clearly, they're defects, so that's what material scientists do. Like. <laughs> so things have to be like a little off for us to, our job to be this. So one of the things you can take away from this is all snowflakes are sixfold, but no two snowflakes are the same. So there is an aspect that is not changing, but then there is so much diversity within that, there, there's so much room that um, you, you can have many different planes of variations on that. So the, the, the point uh, that I just made, I want to summarize I think symmetry is the unity in diversity. So that unity of the six-foldness, it may not be regular hexagon, it may be off a little. And that's where once the nature lays down some very basic template, the symmetry template, then everything else takes over, the kinetics and so on. And they try to break it and try to sort of play around it, get some jiggle. Okay, so that's one of the three points I wanted to um, now you could heat it up a little, and that happens. <laughs> so your six-point symmetry is gone. So if you look very locally in there, there's, there's you know it's all random stuff going on. Um, but then maybe you know on the average on a different scale, maybe other symmetries are on. You know, it might be like very isotropic symmetry. And then if you keep going to maybe about 100 degrees, that happens. Right? So, and uh, so how do we start, you know, how is symmetry going to help me here? Right? So you're sort of at a loss. You're like, okay, fine, the hexagons are okay, but what am I going to do here? So one possibility is we could just start from the gas case and look in the vapor. So you see all these water molecules. They are floating around. They're not talking very much to the other water molecules. So we can focus on simplicity and see what happens with that. So. What is symmetry going to do for us? So, uh, first I have to say what symmetry is. I mean, it's somewhat intuitive, but we have to make it a little mathematical. So here's the mathematical definition. Doing something that looks like doing nothing. Um, and uh, so you look at it and say, no, that's not mathematic. It's really mathematic. You know, it's a very rigorous statement of what a symmetry is. So literally, if you close your eyes, and I kind of go blah, 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 and then come back, and you look at me, and I look the same. Whatever I did in the time you had closed your eyes was a symmetry operation. Because you can't tell the difference before and after. You can do anything you want with the equations, you distort it, do whatever you want, but just undo it before you look again. Right? So, and that sort of gives you the freedom to formulate mathematically how, how, how symmetry should work. So let's just pick on the water molecule because they're there. Um, and uh, these, these are my daughter's uh, toys. I just made this up. And it's an original photography, okay? Just for this event. Um, so immediately we notice there is a two-fold symmetry. So if I flip it 180 degrees, every 180 it looks the same, right? Twice in a circle. And so you have immediately a two-fold symmetry. You have a mirror right there. You can reflect it back and forth. And you also, the screen itself is a mirror. You can reflect it front and back, and slice it, slice it, cut it through, right? Okay, so you take all of this, and uh, reaching to the choir here somewhat, um, but you can put that in a curly bracket, but then you have to add a little one to it. You know, two is for two-fold symmetry, MX and MY are the two mirrors. And the, the, the reason you put a bracket is it makes it a group. A group is a very mathematical idea, but you'll see that it has very physical implications. Right? 
in the one year is basically doing nothing. It's like me going 360 degrees in three months. It's and everything has, doing nothing should always be a symmetry in your groups. Okay. And if you do any of them twice, you know, you get nothing. So nothing has to be there. So the group is closed. So, so you have the symmetry, what do I do with it, right? So I started with water molecules, water falls, and so on and so forth. So I'll just give you a, um, a, a, some, some examples. This is something that we teach in polymerism. Norman's principle, and I sort of am paraphrasing it with taking out a little bit of technicality. I'm saying that every property of this molecule that you could measure must at least reflect the symmetry we just found in you measure its electrical properties, magnetic properties, optical properties, thermal properties, mechanical properties, you must at least reflect the underlying symmetry, the intrinsic properties of the, the symmetry of the atomic energy. And so let's just pick on something called electrical polarization, which is, you know, oxygen is negatively charged, this is positively charged. And so an arrow here is going to tell you it's electrically polarized, negative to positive. But immediately the two pole tells me that there must be an arrow the other way. So immediately I know that those two will cancel and I can't really have an electrical polarization or what we call dipole in this direction. And if you play around, you can figure out that the only direction it can be is that. So water is a polar molecule. Polarization we I totally understand if you're reading the news what polarization means. We are very polarized right now. But polarization is a feature here, not about. It's uh, the cause for, you know, us being made of 60, 70, I don't know, percent water, right? And this electrical polarization helps you to start thinking about, you know, interaction of different water molecules with each other. And two of these polarizations are trying to line up with each other. So the molecule has to rotate, and all of these are rotating because something else gets messed up. And this is a molecular dynamic simulation, and these purple lines are, are, are the hydrogen on this one trying to talk to the, the oxygen on the other one and trying to jump. Okay, I have to say all this is out of size. This, these hydrogens are about 50,000 times smaller than this. So it's really, you know, just putting it on the top surface. It jumps around for a So this is called hydrogen bond. Right? Um, and uh, so let's see. Um, you could uh, think about dances of this thing. You can figure out how these molecules dance just from doing a little bit of group theory. And, and you can figure out that it has got three dances, which are stretching, symmetric stretch, bending, asymmetric stretch, and so on. And then it's got libration, which is sort of it's twirling about three axes. I found only videos for two, so the third one I would just do it here. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that's what's going on there. Six one. But you know, how did I come up with six dances? Three atoms, three dimensions, nine of well, six things. So I took three out, because three of them are trivial, because if all these atoms decide to fly off in this direction or this or this, then it's kind of not a dance, but it keeps running across the stage. So we take them out. Um, okay, so here is water molecule, you know, the absorption, how different wavelengths of light are absorbed by this material. And you can see that right here is our eye. We can see right here in the visible spectrum. That's where the light evolved. And all of these are the vibrations, you can see them. So these dances you figure out purely from pen and paper are there when you do the experiments. All right, um, here's a sodium chloride crystal. Okay, very squarish, periodic lattice. And there are only 230 crystal groups. You know, some of you know this, you have taken the class. You can ask, how many such crystals can I make where things repeat? Answer is 230. Right? So that's the, something that symmetry can tell you. You know, if you look around for crystals, there are so many. But there's that unity and diversity that there's also something called time. We forgot about time. We're talking about spatial symmetry. 
But if you, something is evolving in one way, if you split time, this is one of the tricks, mathematical tricks, by spin the other way, and you use this for electrons. So electrons, when an electron is spinning, it's a magnet. So if it's an up magnet or a down magnet, you can use this to understand magnetic crystals. That is lodestone, that is uh, one of the original magnets. 2,000 years ago in Greece, they discovered that about 100 BC, 2,000 BC, 4,000 years ago. 100 BC, the Chinese made a compass out of it, and that changed our history, right? But if you start zooming in until the, the previous century, quantum mechanics, you know, figured out that this is going on in there. And you can go in and figure out all of the spins, which some of them are pointing one way, some of the other, and this time reversal can flip between these two. So there are relationships between these spins. And all of these magnetic crystals, so you can ask, how many ways can I arrange a magnetic crystal? And symmetry can tell you 1,421. No, very precise numbers. And you can find, look for 1,420 seconds, you can't find it. Um, I'm going to skip this one um, in the interest of time. And the second point, so I wanted to make the symmetry guides properly. Okay, I have a few more slides. If you don't know. Okay. How many do we have? Oh, okay, okay, all right. So you came over here and I'm like, okay, I got to finish up. All right, okay, maybe I should do this slide. Let me keep going, right? So the second point is symmetry guides properties. All right. The third point I want to make is symmetry is also built underneath all of the physical laws. Well, we appreciate this already. And we just talked about time reversal. Time reversal is just a simple switch up and down. It flips future to past, past to future, and then quantum mechanics gets a little more complicated. But more or less, that's the idea. Um, and if you look at Newton's laws, if you look at Maxwell's equation that describes light, if you look at how electrons are orbiting around the nucleus, the Schrodinger's equation, you find that if you flip the time switch, going forward versus backwards, the equations are the same. Okay? So that flipping of the time switch is a symmetry of those laws. Right? And so, it, is, it turns out, I said many laws, not all of them. There are some weak interactions where there's a uh, nuclear decay, where the time reversal is actually broken. But considering many of these things that do happen with, with time switch, it doesn't matter because it can be do time travel. And the answer is, well, no. For, for example, some of the effects you cannot do time reversal. And there's another very subtle reason for it. And this is uh, a little clip from uh, Mar when Marty was there by Hayao Miyazaki. Hayao Miyazaki is amazing. I got HBO just to watch all of these things, and then I, then I, then I ended my, my subscription. <laughs> I was finishing Hayao Miyazaki. Okay, so, you know, you, you look at this, this uh, castle, the same castle, it's gone, right? And if the time reversal was true, even if it was Newtonian, you can sort of think back and you could reverse time and go back all the way so, so that the water should recede and the castle should come back up, right? But it is, doesn't happen, right? Time seems to be flowing forward all the time. And that has to do with the fact that this is one very particular configuration of sand among trillions and trillions and trillions and trillions of possibilities. So the probability is there that it would happen, but it's very small. And so the arrow of time, the flow of time that we experience, one of the uh, ideas behind that is that, you know, the, the entropy, the idea that things get disordered, there are too many possibilities, the thing that will trace, exactly trace its way back is very small. All right, um, this is my last slide, and I want to connect symmetry to laws of conservation. Um, this is one of the, if you're a physicist, you know this lady, Emmy Noether, Emmy, Emmy Noether. Uh, and Albert Einstein called her the most significant mathematical genius of the 20th century. And unfortunately, most people, or many people don't know her. 
she issued was a very fine document. She was brilliant, unfortunately. She didn't get the recognition. Finally, she did cross the border. She, I mean, the sea, she came, uh, thanks to Hitler, came over to Pennsylvania, Bryn Mawr. And she was a professor here. And for the first time in her life, she got recognition for her genome. And unfortunately, within a few years, she had a surgery that got lost. It was very early then. But um, one of the things that underlies all of physics, you know, I might say, because I don't know all of physics, I can say that. <laughs> so is that if there is a symmetry in nature, there will be a law of conservation underneath that. And that equation above describes that, and I'm not obviously going through it. But conservation of energy, let's just pick on that, right? Energy is conserved. You can't create or destroy energy. Where does that come from? Well, what she showed was if the laws of physics today are the same as the laws of physics tomorrow or the laws of physics yesterday, if that was true, then there must be something called energy that must be conserved. The same thing with momentum. So momentum says that if the laws of physics are the same here versus back in my home versus in Mars or Moon or whatever, then there must be something called momentum that must be conserved. So, on and so, forth. so every time you think of some conservation, there is an underlying symmetry fabric or, or a foundation to it. Okay. All right, so uh, that was my third point that symmetry underlies nature's law. So that's my talk. I might have shot up a little bit, uh, uh, shot over my time a little bit, but th those were the other two points I made, symmetry by its properties, and symmetry with unity and diversity. And so with that, I let you enjoy Voodoo Brewery. And, and you know, I didn't make any ethanol jokes, uh, <laughs> ethanol has more molecules, by the way. And so if you're going to do that calculation of how many dances does it ethanol, it's about nine atoms, three dimensions, 27, take away a tree, you have 24 dances. So you can be feeling very perky All right. OK, thank you very much. symmetries are relevant uh, only at very extreme regimes, uh, like the Big Bang and also black holes. So the density and the temperature are very high, and um, it's so high that we haven't uh, probed the corresponding physics in the lab, and we won't be able to do, to do this for a long time. But um, that makes symmetries all more important, because we can um, analyze the mathematics. It restricts the possibilities for interactions, and we can see what might have happened after the Big Bang. Uh, the big question is um, from the description by uh, general relativity, which uh, first of all tells us that space and time are very important in these regimes at high densities. But it also tells us that the Big Bang was really, in this setting, not um, mathematically well defined. It's a singularity. The density would have been infinite where all our equations break down. And uh, it doesn't in include uh, quantum physics. So um, it has to be a combination. Now a few numbers just to see the extreme scales. Uh, we know we don't know much about the combination of quantum physics and general relativity, but we know corresponding numbers. We know the strength of gravity. Uh, all these have been measured. It uh, will be relativistic because um, molecules are very high speed at these extremes, so we need the speed of light. And from quantum mechanics, we take the length of quantum jumps, uh, quotation marks, because it's not a length in space; it's in energies. But there's a corresponding constant as well, uh, Planck's constant. And um, Planck also noticed that all these parameters can be combined in a unique way to get a length, which is very tiny. 
uh, corresponds to, um, well, 10 mega 35 meters, so that means one meter per contains about one trillion, trillion, trillion of these Planck length. Uh, and um, even at high energy accelerators, where we can go really tiny distances, we are far from these scales. As a density, it's more than one trillion solar masses in a proton sized region, so we usually produce high densities by accelerating particles and smashing them together. Here we would need to accelerate uh, stars and smash them together, which um, we probably won't ever be able to do. But uh, we don't give up because in physics, we can often probe new phenomena indirectly, and a related example is the atomic structure of matter, uh, not space and time, which by now is firmly established. And the first evidence in physics was an indirect analysis when Einstein analyzed Brownian motion, so that's uh, on the left here. So if um, we have small grains, like water grains, uh, in a the liquid, then the molecules in the liquid uh, uh, imply almost random pushes on these pawn grains, and the motion can be computed with these statistical properties, that's what Einstein did. And uh, a little bit later it was measured. Um, and um, the motion depends on the size of these molecules, so it's indirect evidence for the size and in the existence of atoms of matter. Um, at that time, people had only light microscopy. There's, there was no way to resolve this case directly. It took another 50 years for Irvin Muller at Penn State uh, to develop field ion microscopy and he produced the first direct images with atomic resolution. And uh, for atoms of space or quantum properties of space or time, we hope we will at some point follow a similar trajectory only on much longer time scales. So we're first looking for indirect evidence and potential phenomena. Um, now, something that we expect for atomic space is, uh, first of all, there has to be a new vacuum. So, the vacuum is important in particle physics because it's the basic state on which um, anything else can be constructed, moving particles. But um, this vacuum or empty space is actually full of space. And uh, when we're talking about atoms of space, we would have to remove all these spatial atoms as well. So it's a completely different state, which is um, hard to describe. Even language gets a bit tricky in this context. But um, math is another language, which um, still remains valid at these scales, so we can analyze it. And um, on the next few slides, I'll show how symmetries uh, help us. But um, also, um, first about the Big Bang, um, this weakness implies that there's limited capacity to store energy. So here, this weakness would just be the number line. And if we try to put a continuous wave on this discrete space, if the wavelength is long, we can sample the wave um, almost exactly by these um, little stars. But if the wavelength gets smaller, the high frequency wave, it has more energy. So um, at some point, the wavelength will be too short, and we see a much larger wavelength by sampling it on this discrete space. Um, so that's a an indication of this uh, some kind of pushing out of the, the energy if um, the uh, scales get too small. Now for the Big Bang, that means the density can't really be infinite if there's discrete space, and um, the one possibility is called a bounce. Uh, so here, uh, vertically, we have the volume, and then to the right, as a function of time, the colors indicate some form wave function. But uh, the important thing here is um, instead of reaching infinite density, we have something like a, a, a precursor collapsing universe where the volume is decreasing. It reaches a maximum density, which is not infinite, which is pretty big, like the Planck density, but still finite. And um, that's where space starts pushing out the energy. Um, there's nothing outside of the universe where it could push the energy, so the only possibility is to reverse the contraction and um, enter our expanding universe. So that's a possibility, but we still have to see if it's really a universe. We have to make sure it's space and time, and not just um, something else, not just the volume parameter. And that's where symmetries finally uh, come back in. So uh, it's getting a little more technical here, because these are not intuitive symmetries. We have to visualize uh, space and time. 
But um, the first step here is uh, something we know well, rotation in space. It's uh, just a simple angle. And then uh, mathematically, we use these diagrams or reference directions um, to show how things get rotated. In space-time, we don't have an intuitive picture, so we have to use um, theory, in this case special relativity, which tells us that the uh, angle is replaced by what's called a boost. Uh, since we're uh, rotating our perspective, we uh, change our speed, or if we are observing something, uh, to uh, speed us up or slow us down. Um, so that would replace the angle. Um, the other ingredient we need is um, the fact that the speed of light is constant. That's also from special relativity and has been confirmed by measurement. Um, we can use this to construct a new diagram. So that's at the bottom here. Um, first, um, before we do the boost, we have uh, black axes. And um, if we don't know yet what the time direction should be, we can construct it. We can start uh, uh, sending light rays from opposite points uh, from x equal to zero towards x equal to zero. And because all of them have the same speed of light, they have to meet in the middle at x equal to zero. And that's our time axis. After the boost, uh, so we're trying to push our x prime axis up as we did here, we can um, then also send light rays inwards. The right ones, they still move at the same speed of light, but the right one starts later. Push the axis up on that side. So it doesn't, it can travel as far as the other light ray, which means the two light rays now need a little bit uh, to the right. And um, then that's our new T prime axis. So the difference is we have to push the axes uh, towards each other. We don't uh, uh, keep the right angle fixed. So there's a different notion of the conserved right angle between the axes and uh, corresponding a new geometry. So. Um, um, and again, that's something that's not intuitive at all, but um, we have the math here to describe things. Um, this can be generalized. So first of all, we can use these ideas to um, analyze um, space-time, almost like we analyze matter. We can push it and see how it reacts. We can push uh, space in space-time and see how it reacts, at least mathematically. So that's what we just uh, saw by this const construction. We can extend this to general relativity. General relativity describes gravity through a curvature of space-time. So we only have to introduce curvature, which means we use curved lines instead of straight lines. And uh, we keep the same kind of uh, modified right angles because it's space-time and not uh, two-dimensional space. Uh, what we don't know very well yet is to generalize this uh, to quantum gravity. So we need some kind of discrete uh, deformations to take into account these uh, spatial atoms. Uh, we do have a few indications. Uh, one of them is shown here. Um, um, so that's actually combinations of different transformations. It's a little bit like the groups that Benkin mentioned. So we combine different operations and, uh, in this case, compare the outcomes. Uh, it's actually a bit more complicated. It's a groupoid, not a group. So that's a more complicated mathematical object. Um, but um, we don't have to worry about this here. So uh, what we see here is um, two of these deformations in two opposite orderings. So that means um, the angle means we've boosted the observer, so um, some speed. And then we go back to a horizontal line, which means we go back to the original speed. Um, physically, what we expect is um, we've been moving at some speed. We just moved a certain distance in space. And that's what we see here, with these arrows, if we compare the two outcomes um, in the two opposite orderings. Now, um, so the, um, the physical picture of motion is much easier than geometry, but geometry helps us to compare space-time with space. If we repeat the same construction but now use actual right angles in, uh, as in standard geometry, we get almost the same result, but the angles are reversed. They point in the opposite direction. So mathematically, there's just a minus sign which uh, helps us to distinguish space-time from space. Now, in quantum gravity, there are some uh, indications that um, after long calculations in these atomic spaces, the same reversal of arrows happens uh, not by changing our geometry, but just by moving to a higher density. So at low density, as we know, there's space and time. So we have something like on the left here. 
If we go to high density plus the point density, it turns out the errors are reversed. So uh, instead of space-time, we still have something four-dimensional, but it's all space. There's no time. So in cosmology, uh, we have this um, boundedness of the density, but um, space-time analysis then shows there's actually no time, so we don't actually move through these bounds. We're still working on an interpretation. It's come, uh, become a little bit easier recently because we all know what a lockdown is. And that was like a lockdown for the entire universe. Even electrons and protons couldn't go out and interact because there was no time. But um, it must have seemed like it was taking forever. There's no time. Time doesn't change. But um, uh, the, the space still had an end because um, there was a second uh, more spatial boundary. So after this preceding collapse here, time stopped, but uh, somehow uh, reappeared on the other side of this lockdown and uh, started our expanding universe. Um, so that's a new picture. It's still non-singular, so the density remains finite. We just have to make sense of the, uh, the loss of time in the middle. And before I run out of time here, I'll stop and uh, I think we can both take questions. Yeah, um, I mean, we have to, if we want to confirm this, we have to find some of this indirect evidence that I mentioned. So, so something that's um, indicated here in the plot is the cosmic microwave background. So there's some uh, very small density of variations at the beginning of our expanding universe, which we can um, measure. So there's still radiation, cost of, yeah, microwave radiation that can be measured. And um, there's a lot of information in the statistics. Um, so um, if we really develop these models um, to a degree in which we can see how these density variations might get modified by the preceding phase, then we, that would be indirect evidence if we can actually measure these uh, tiny modifications. Still have to see how likely that will be, but um, at least it's, it's a possibility. So this graphic is interesting. I guess if I understood you correctly, there's, it's kind of asserting symmetry in time and saying that our universe is expanding, entropy is increasing. It's also possible that before the Big Bang, there was a period of time where the second law of thermodynamics was opposite and everything was decreasing in entropy. And is that, does that imply everything was kind of equal and opposite? or could it have been different from, from what it is now? I guess the state of the universe. Yeah, it's also an open question. Um, there are really these two possibilities that you mentioned, and they're both being discussed in the literature. Um, so, yeah, uh, if entropy is decreasing here, uh, we would actually define um, the error of time that uh, Venkan mentioned as going up like this. So both, it would, would be just two separate universes that both started in this timeless phase here. Um, the other option is that, um, that entropy really increased. It looks symmetric here, but that's just because I just copied it. <laughs> I didn't uh, <laughs> uh, have time to produce a new picture. Um, so entropy could also be increasing here. And then a problem that's been discussed for almost 100 years is if, if entropy has already been increasing here, why do we still have order on, on the right in our region? And this uh, timelessness might actually help it, um, because there's no evolution. So entropy, everything is basically reset um, over here. And then um, 
And so for entropy, it's good because then it can start here um, at a low level. Uh, for these indirect uh, tests, it's bad because if nothing evolves through it, it makes it even more indirect. So, um, and there's still possibilities, but it just makes it harder. Yeah, this is for the main test, actually. Yeah. Um, so you talked about polar bond between water molecules and how symmetry affects that. So I was just wondering, do we know of uh, symmetry as well in any other kinds of bond work? Um, yeah, so I, I flash to the you know, sodium chloride and all of that, you know, all of those crystal structures. So one of the, and, and I also had slides on how electrons are shared between atoms. So you could, for example, take even the water molecule and uh, you know take the S and P electron closes the orbitals of oxygen and combine it with certain orbitals of hydrogen, and the symmetry will tell you exactly how many new orbitals will be formed. And uh, you know, and then you start filling them, and it tells you what the distribution of electrons between them would be for each one of those levels, as you know, from quantum mechanics. So that's bonding, basically. And that happens not just in water, but in, in, in everything. Hey, Nila. Um, how many of us like a symmetric garden? Garden? Yeah, symmetric, yes. symmetry in your garden. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I think our brain is hardwired for symmetry, except my husband. <laughs> so I'm wondering, uh, why does our brain prefer symmetry versus asymmetry? Is it something with the molecules? Oh, uh, you should be telling me you're in biochemistry. And so I'm going to shoot my mouth off because I'm the speaker and you asked me the question. But then you can correct me. Um, <laughs> okay, this is very interesting. I make a lot of words there, like putting on the show here. <laughs> um, so, but, uh, but, you know, one of the ways that I view symmetry in general, uh, and even especially from material science, like I said, we see symmetry, uh, you know, in the flake, and then you start zooming in, it's gone. <laughs> And then you look at it at transmission electron microscope and the atoms are like, you know, not exactly in the same place. It's all messed up. And then you zoom out or you shine x-ray through it and you see diffraction patterns that look like, hey, there's symmetry. But then the diffraction patterns have some fuzziness to it. So they're a little bit of, you know, they're all trying to push their limit. So um, I have a somewhat utilitarian view of symmetry in, in, in condensed matter at least. Uh, although there are some fundamental aspects of it. And that is, you know, it really simplifies the amount of information that your brain has to process. So, for example, if you look at, you know, human beings or animals, you know, we have bilateral symmetry, left and right, are sort of symmetric. So when I look at somebody and I'm like, I've seen the left, I know what's on the right. <laughs> you know? But, if you really sort of, uh, you know, uh, uh, pay a lot of attention and focus, and maybe even take a picture and photocopy half into the other half, that person would look different. That would be a different person. So they are not exactly, you know, a mirror, but it's close enough that our brain starts from that point, and then it says, "Oh wait, they are only one ear right here, or you know, they've got like a mold over here." So they look for what is called the symmetry breaking. So that just, I think, is a very efficient process of information processing. That we first, and that's what physicists do too. I mean, with, I, I mean correct me if I'm ardent, but you know, you start out with a very symmetric universe, and then say, well, with just if this was a hypersphere in four dimensions, it was all these hyperspheres, these symmetries of space-time, then you, you know. Uh, these would be the particles that should exist. These, this is how the forces should behave. Then you start going and doing experiments, you say, oh, it's messed up a little bit here. And then you say, oh, that's symmetry breaking, and you try to understand that. So it's just the process in which we, we 
Surfing is a mathematical tool. That's the first thing I want to say. So, uh, but it's amazing that it works so well for practical purposes. Does that satisfy you somewhat? <laughs> Do you have a, an opinion on this you want to share? <laughs> Go ahead. No, no, I'm good. Okay. Um, thank you both for giving a great talk on both two very different examples. Um, but thank you, I have a question about one of your comments saying that I can predict materials properties if I know the symmetry of a molecule. But what do you do when um, you know you start seeing collective or emergent properties that you that take you out of that initial step? And how, are there ways to actually think about predicting simply beyond symmetry, but how when things actually start coming together? interacting? Yeah. <laughs> um. Yeah, so there, there may be two aspects to that question. One is, you know, the symmetry can do a lot of heavy lifting. It's like a template, but it can't do all of the heavy lifting. You need the physics again to be on it. So, for example, the symmetry can tell you this molecule should be polar because it's got negative and positive and there's a bend to it. It can't tell you what the polarization should be. For that, you need the physics. You need to calculate the values. It can tell you, you know, a diamond should be strong or because it has all these bonds, you know, covalent bonding. But it can't tell you how strong. Um, so you have to, you have to bring in the thing. So, so that, that's one aspect. But it does, um, so your question was about uh, emergent behavior. Um, so that's where this idea of symmetry breaking becomes important. That is, you know, you may have something and then that's broken or in, during the interactions, but then there might be some collective symmetries that might arise. And it also depends on the scale with which you're viewing. If you zoom in, maybe you don't see it. If you zoom out, maybe you see some average symmetry. And if your physical reality is good at that scale, you're okay with that symmetry. You can use it to predict you know, that water is isotropic. Uh, because you're not looking at the water molecules, averaging over all that. So you could use QD groups, for example, uh, in infinite form rotation with your, and so on and so forth to predict properties of some uh, water or some isotropic material. And uh, um, you know, until it doesn't work anymore, then you gotta break that symmetry and look at. I just have a comment for all the young scientists here. Um, I don't know if you, how many of you have heard of the quasi crystals. Um, you have. Did anybody has actually seen the quasi crystal Nobel speech given by the scientists? Please go and look up. It's, I think it's 2013 Chemistry Nobel, and it's remarkable. So, uh, that, that's all my comment about it <laughs> um, because it redefined crystal. Or crystallography, so uh, it's really remarkable and um, something to see. So look. Uh, thank you for bringing that up. You know, I skipped a few slides, but I also walked, <laughs> slid over a few things. Right, right. So, I, but I said, you know, the atoms can arrange only in 230 ways to make crystals. Uh, well, there are uh, more. And one of the other things that you predict from the sort of simple mathematics is that. You'll never see a five-fold like pentagonal rotation in crystals, um, but but that's not well, the crystals that have five-fold symmetry. So the the answer there is that those are quasi crystals. They're not. They're fake. Quasi means fake. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, but, but you know, uh, physicists use the word pseudo. That also means fake. Like pseudo vector, pseudo. pseudo um, but but anyway, the the main difference between the real crystals and the quasi crystals is, in in real crystals you repeat and repeats over and over and over the exact same template. In quasi crystals, it will never repeat itself. So it will still form a crystal, but it won't repeat itself. Uh, hi, uh, my question is about uh, uh, Martin and. It's it's about when you when we spoke about the arrow of time. So uh, if I think back, all the laws that I've ever studied, all the formulas I've ever studied, there's only one place 
right, that I can remember when we talk about time, and that's the second law of thermodynamics, right? So um, I always feel very surprised to think that, I mean, law is, after all, a physically motivated statement. And it's surprising that a physically motivated statement can capture something so deep, right? Um, arrow of time from the law. So I might be getting it wrong. So my question is that, is there anything else that um, you know, pushed people to believe that you know, this law is a actually thing that holds everywhere? Um, no, um, I think even Boltzmann, who came up with the law, um, uh, I think in his last few years he doubted it. <laughs> he, actually, he, had, he wasn't sure if it was actually right. There's some correspondence. He didn't publish it, I think, but there's some correspondence. Um, yeah, it, it, the connection is often made between the arrow of time and the second law of thermodynamics, but the second law of thermodynamics is more a statement of the initial state because it still applies in time reversely in the area of physics. So unless you say that your initial state is somehow special, like the one that we usually assume in the universe, which has almost no density variations, uh, you don't get the second law of thermodynamics. And, um, what uh, Boltzmann was talking about is that um, so after some time entropy may well go down. It's just um, with our states that we usually consider, it's much more likely that it keeps going up for as long as we observe it. But if we wait long enough, it will go down eventually. So, um, so the connection is not very clear with um, the, the, the era of time. And, um, and, and there's nothing else, so we don't really know. Why we are, why, first of all, why is there this difference between past and future? The only statement is again the initial state. For some reason, it, it was very special, and it's still been evolving away from that state, which is easier in the universe because it's expanding. If everything being closed in a finite box, after 14 billion years, we would have repeated ourselves many times, but space is expanding, so it opens up um, new possibilities. And, um, it probably goes on like this for several billion years, but we don't know. Maybe it reverses itself again. Maybe the whole universe will collapse again at some point. We don't know. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, I asked you. <laughs> so my question is for Venkat. Um, what, what practical and or simple applications do you see this having in the foreseeable future? For example, you know, we look at the discovery of electromagnetic radiation and it has all sorts of broad applications. What broad applications do you think the understanding symmetry in the universe around us has? Uh, the answer is everything <laughs> and nothing. <laughs> uh, because it's kind of uh, like saying, you know, what broad application does bread have? I mean, you can make lots of sandwiches. <laughs> um, but, you know, uh, it's really like the base. Um, Hello. So, the, the, you know, it's, a, it's, it's really a mathematical tool. It's, it's almost like saying what good is mathematics. Um, uh, and the answer is you can apply it, you know, and although it's an idealization, like a circle or a triangle, if you draw an actual circle, it's not a line, an actual line is not a line, it has a bit, it has bumpiness on a paper. But we, it's still useful, right? So it's the same, same sort of ideas, you know, the, the symmetry. But some of the symmetries he's talking about are, are exact. And so it is surprising that something purely abstract can be so useful. In, in, in Do you have an opinion on this? Um, <laughs> <laughs> It would be like asking Boolean, what good is Boolean algebra back when it was first came out? It's a language after all, symmetry and all that is language. And you never know where it might take us. So that, that's, that's the only. I don't right. give right. that example whenever I talk about symmetry. Okay, that's uh, another interesting for you. Yeah. It's a language, and uh, it makes life simpler. If you, you have a perspective, and a simpler perspective on, on how to view things. Because there's just so much stuff out there, right? And so many laws, so many things. How do you cut through, slice through this? 
So you can think of it like an ice cream. You can make it, chunk it up nicely, it makes it nice. That's a really good question. I don't know. <laughs> but, but, but yeah, you, you should look it up. Yeah, yeah. No, it, now you're, you've made me curious. <laughs> I, I think so because it's all this black background. It's just very perfect. They must be new creating it. Yeah. Are there any other questions? I have a question for Martin. Okay. <laughs> So this, you, you, you said something about how there's no time and there's the space, so it, you're saying the time stops and therefore there's no time, just because time stops. Now the only time I know when time stops <laughs> is when you go at the speed of light, right? When you, light, light has zero, see zero time lapse. So is that, so are you saying that things are speeded up the speed of light there and then you build know, that uh, mass? No, it's um, it's different. Um, I mean, time doesn't really um, just stop; it gets converted into space. And that that doesn't happen at the speed of light. So it's really a new thing, which uh, makes a little bit like uh, because it's uh, later produced with space. Um, so um, there are optical phenomena. You can you can slow down a light ray um, in um, matter material, for instance. So maybe it's a little bit like this. So you, instead of uh, speeding it, if you're going to the speed of light, you slow down light, and um, and then what's left? There's anything else is at the speed of light, so it's, it's only space. That, uh, but, um, yeah, I don't know, it's, it's more in the, uh, in the, in the uh, structure. You have to imagine space time as some kind of crystal, or, or, or just space, and then time duration, something happens that uh, we don't really understand. <laughs> but, I mean, it's in the map, but it's... Um, in, in flat space-time, though, as far as I understand, the only time when time completely converts to space is when it reaches the light line. Yeah. What you're saying in curved space, that's not true. Uh, yeah, it's not only curved, it's also extremely dense. High curvature. That's the that's Planck density. So that's um, something that we, um, we we just don't know. We don't have any experience with it. So in some way, um, it's uh, space is too dense to to let even time pass through, um, which is related to these uh, um, the sampling effects. So energy gets pushed out, and uh, once all the energy is, gets pushed out, nothing can move anymore. So if you don't have motion, you don't. made was interesting to me. You said if we don't have motion, we don't have time. So if we could take a system of some kind and bring it to actually zero Kelvin, no motion at all, would it be stopped in time? Yeah, probably. Um, but there's another law of thermodynamics which tells you you can't get there. <laughs> which is probably more reliable than the second law. <laughs> Unfortunately, it has our old logo, but it's